Well, last week, if you were here last week, you know I said, hey, this is the last week of our Hope Forever series, and uh, then I planned on having a, a message today, the March or May is Mental Health Awareness Month, and so I dove into this topic, this idea of I was going to share a message this morning on mental health. And by about Wednesday of this week, I realized that it would be irresponsible of me to share one message on mental health and, uh, and how uh, I would have had more questions than answers. And so I, I started shifting my focus from mental health to emotional and spiritual health. And what does it look like um, as we've been in this series, Hope Forever, um, to, to really find God in all circumstances, to experience hope in all circumstances. And so here's what we're going to do. Um, we're going to launch the new series next week. Um, called Defining Moments. It's going to be a case study, a five-week case study in the life of Peter. But then next May, we're going to do a four-week series on mental health. And uh, we, we tackled that subject in October. So about you know, six or seven months ago, we, we talked about that. Um, but I want to spend more time unpacking it and really uh, addressing some of the things that have become a stigma in our society. And so um, we've already blocked out the four weeks in, in May and, um, and Mother's Day is included in that. And talking about joy on Mother's Day and how we can find joy even when we don't feel joyful. And, and so that's going to be next week. And I'm going to conclude. I'm actually going to conclude our series today. And so, you know, it's like it's like, basically like a Marvel, you know, movie. You thought it was over, but it's not over. Okay? You thought Endgame was the end? No. There's all kinds of movies coming out. All right? For Marvel. So that's kind of the Hope Forever series. When I say forever, I mean forever. Okay? And so this is week five, final week. We are starting a new series next week. But I do want to talk about how we can, it's easy to find hope in, on the mountaintops in life. How do we experience hope in the valleys? Right? And for, for me personally, I've, I've experienced several valleys in my life. Some of them have been self-inflicted valleys, the decisions that I've made that have put me into a deep funk or a, a deep place of, of needing God's presence. Some of them have been choices of other people that have sent me into a valley spiritually or emotionally. Uh, some of them have just been circumstances in life. And so how, how do we find God in the valleys. How do we experience hope in the valley? That's what I want to talk about today, and we're going to look at a kind of an obscure book in the Old Testament I'm excited to dive into uh, here in just a few minutes. But I got, a, I got a text message yesterday from a friend of mine. He's a pastor of a church of about 3,000 people, and I've known him for several years, and um, we actually went to the same college, and, and um, he, he texted me yesterday, and he said, hey, are you and Trish available to get together? My wife and I are in town uh, this weekend for Memorial Day. We'd love to connect with you. And I was literally in the process of packing and unpacking. Uh, my oldest son moved to Noblesville yesterday. He starts his new job at Northview uh, on Tuesday as a student pastor at the Carmel campus. And so he and his wife moved into town, my, my in-laws. His in-laws were in town from Michigan, and so we were all together. And then so we were all in Noblesville all day yesterday unpacking his stuff, getting his apartment set up. And, and then Trisha is speaking in Michigan today at a, at a church in Detroit. So she was leaving from there, and it was just, it was just not a good day. And I said, man, I, I wish I, would, I could try to make it happen, but just not available today. And, and this weekend's kind of tough with Memorial Day and Trisha being out of town. And, and he said, hey, no problem. We'll, we'll catch you on the next, next time through. And then he said, I don't know if you've heard or not, but I'm no longer at my church anymore. And I was like, no, I, I did not hear that. And he said, as of May 1st, I'm no longer the senior pastor. And Trish and I had spoken to this church a few years ago, and church of, you know, 3,000 people or so, and very influential in the community, and this guy's a great leader. He's just a phenomenal um, pastor and communicator, and, and it was just, it was like, I, I just didn't have any words, and I said, what, what in the world happened? He said, I was called into an elders meeting on May 1st and told, hey, you're done and today is your last day. And I was like, whoa. And I honestly, I texted him back and I said, I have no words to share with you. Like, I don't even know what to say to that. And he said, we're, we're in a really raw and really difficult place. He's like, I have no clue what is next. And I have no idea what happened. And I said, why in the world would, would they just end it like that? He said, no moral failure, no sin issues. The only issue they could, they could acknowledge to me was attendance trends were not going in the direction they thought they should, as fast as they thought they should. And so I'm done. He said, would you please pray for us because we're in this place where we have to dream for the future because we have to move on to something else after 10 years. I don't know, 10 years, I'm thinking, eight to 10 years at, the, at, this loca at this church. And at the same time, mourn the loss of 
ministry and the loss of people and the loss of, you know, this, this investment that we've made over the last 10 years. And I could just tell just from, just from his text message, he and his wife, they're in a valley. And he has all of these questions and very little answers. And what was, what's, so in, what's so hard about being a pastor is he has to reconcile the goodness of God and begin to try to dream about the goodness of God while mourning the loss of all of this influence and all of, this, all of these people and all of these relationships and, and all of this investment over the last 10 years. It's a really messy place to be. And my guess is, maybe not in the same circumstance, maybe you don't walk into to work on Tuesday and your boss says, hey, by the way, this is your last day, go pack up your desk. That might not happen, but here's what I know to be true about all of us. You're either going into something, you're either coming out of something, or you're in the middle of something right now. That's just the way that life is. You're either in a valley, you're coming out of a valley, or you're getting ready to go into a valley. And how do we find hope? I could just sense from my friend this, this search for spiritual and emotional hope in the context of great loss. And so what does it look like to find hope when the circumstances of your life don't add up to being hopeful? And here's what I know to be true. I put this in your notes. Uh, that this, this is true, that a committed follower of Jesus can both wrestle with honest questions and embrace a genuine faith in God at the same time. That if you're a follower of Jesus, what happens so often in the church is we've been conditioned to believe that if you follow Jesus, do not question him. If you're a follower of Jesus, then just take life as it comes. Consider, you know, everything pure joy and just go with it. But I, I believe that if you're a follower of Jesus, you can both wrestle with the questions about God at the same time embracing a genuine faith. And I'll say this, I'll go this far. I don't think it's possible to have an authentic faith without wrestling with questions. Look at anybody in the Old or New Testament that did anything significant for God. They just did not go with the flow. There was a, there was a sense of wrestling. There was a sense of, of, of trying to come to terms with God's goodness in the midst of tragedy, in the midst of heartache, in the midst of confusion. That, that's why... I'm more convinced as ever, the older I get, the more I appreciate the Bible. Because if it, were, if it were not true, it would be written as a fairy tale. But it is true. Because there's real life examples. Even after the resurrection of Jesus, there are real life examples of people struggling to believe. People who follow Jesus, people who led the church, struggling to believe all of the goodness of Christ. All of the goodness of God. And so it is possible as a follower of Jesus to both wrestle with honest questions at the same time embrace new aspects of your faith. And I can sense my friend wrestling with God's goodness and God's plan at the same time trying to embrace what he knows to be true about God, that he is good, that he is faithful. And sometimes we have to embrace that even when our emotions don't Feel that, right? And so this morning, I want to I talk to you out of a passage of Scripture. We're actually going to look at uh, an Old Testament book of Habakkuk. Everybody say Habakkuk. Habakkuk. Let's try that again. Everybody say Habakkuk. Habakkuk. All right. I don't even know if I'm pronouncing it right, so I might just lead you astray right there, okay? But it's, 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 uh, it, it's an Old Testament prophet, and um, Habakkuk is what is called a minor prophet. There are major prophets. There are minor prophets in the Old Testament. And all prophets in the Old Testament, they all had the same role and they all had the same authority. A prophet in the Old Testament was someone who was commissioned by God to speak on God's behalf. It's different than a priest. A priest represented God's presence. A prophet in the Old Testament spoke as if God was speaking. Okay, so oftentimes they would speak uh, into the future, but oftentimes they would speak about God's wrath, about God's promises. There was, there was this authority that a prophet had that separated a prophet from anybody else. And so you had religious leaders, you had priests, you had Levites, which were, Levites were like the assistant, like the associate pastors. Okay, and then you had the priests that kind of people had to go through to get into God's presence. They had to go through a priest, but a prophet was like right under God. That's why Jesus, when he comes, people are like, man, he's a teacher, Oh, wow, he's a religious leader. Oh, wow, he's a prophet. And then finally they realized, no, he's the Messiah. Okay, and so there, was these, there were these prophets that, that at different times throughout the history of Israel would come on the scene and they would speak truth 
into the life of the nation of Israel. They would help direct and guide the nation of Israel by giving them what God wanted them to hear. Now, the only thing that delineates a major prophet from a minor prophet, that's a, that's a distinction that we have given them as we have translated the Bible. Because the only thing that makes, Ho, or um, not Hosea, well, Hosea is a minor prophet too. The only thing that makes Habakkuk a minor prophet is his book is three chapters long. Take Isaiah, for example, that book is 66 chapters long. And so Isaiah is considered to be a major prophet because of the length of the message that Isaiah came to dispense to the nation of Israel. But Habakkuk's, his, his, his uh, book is only three chapters long, and it's pretty raw, it's pretty honest. And I want you to think about, this is the, what we're gonna, some of the passages that we're going to read together. You're going to think, man, he has some of the same problems with God that I have. He has some of the same issues with God that I have. And I want you to think about, he's in a constant conversation with God in chapter 1, 2, and 3. He's, ta- he's talking to God, and God is speaking back to him. We're going to look at some of those passages together. But this is not just you or I praying. This is somebody who has been elevated as a, as a spokesman on God's behalf, questioning God's direction, questioning God's choices, and asking God how in the world the nation of Israel could be experiencing what they're experiencing if God is so good. The, the, he, he finds himself in a valley, and we're going to see through the, through the three chapters of a Hosea how he experiences hope in the midst of the valley. Sometimes we don't have to go on to the mountaintop to find hope. Sometimes hope meets us right in the valley. And so um, I want to look at uh, his honesty, his transparency, and, uh, and really he has three problems with God that he outlines in, in, uh, in Habakkuk chapter, uh, chapter 1. So let's look at the first one. The first thing that Habakkuk talks about is that God doesn't seem fair. Look at verse um, 2 of chapter 1. He just kind of gets right into it. He says, how long, Lord, must I call for help? But you do not listen. Or cry out to you, violence. Hey, this world is completely violent. Hey, there's, there's all kinds of people killing each other. Sound familiar? This is 2,600 years ago, give or take. We could have written this today. But you do not save. And, and so Hosea, or Hosea, why am I keep saying Hosea? My gosh. Habakkuk, maybe because these are easier to say. Uh, Habakkuk like launches in to this dialogue with God. And he says, hey, God, I'm calling for help. I'm crying out to you. How long must I do that? And you know what? It doesn't seem like you're listening. Have you ever felt like you're praying prayers and they're just hitting the ceiling of your bedroom? Right? You're, you're crying out to God. You're, you're being honest with God. You're, you're praying to God. You're, you're praying to God for an adult child. You're praying to God for your finances. You're praying to God for this job that you can't stand. You're praying to God for a relationship that's broken down. You're praying for reconciliation. You're praying for good things. You're praying prayers like, God, just show me what you want me to do and I'll do it. Just, just let me know. And you just have this feeling like, okay, I'm doing what I'm supposed to do. God, you're not listening. Where are you in this process? That's what Habakkuk is saying. He, he's saying, I'm pleading with you, God. And, and I'm, I'm crying out to you. And, and you're not listening and you're not saving. Maybe for some of you, you, you liked your job. You, you weren't dissatisfied at all. You, you got up, you, you felt like you were crushing it. You'd go to work every day, you were faithful. You showed up on time. You exceeded your company's you know, goals for you. And then one day, the job just went away. You weren't needed anymore. Maybe, you, uh, maybe they could fire somebody that, were, that was younger than you that could do the job for less money. Maybe it's some, you know, somebody bought your company and there, there's redundancy in the organization. And so good luck to you. And all of a sudden, you, you, you didn't really know that you had an issue. You didn't even know that you were in a valley. But you find yourself in a valley. And it wasn't just like you go apply for a new job. That loss of a job, it completely altered your standard of living, your quality of life. And you still haven't been able to recover. You still have medical debt that you're trying to pay off. You still have credit card debt that you use, you know, your credit cards to pay the bills while you're trying to find a job. And the job that you have now is nothing like the job that you loved. Maybe for some of you, it was a marriage. And you loved your spouse. The problem is they did not love you. Maybe for some of you, they started loving someone else. And they left. And they had no remorse. They had no, and you had no recourse. And you were willing to work on it. And you were willing to go to counseling. You were willing to do all these things. And you prayed for reconciliation. You prayed for restoration. And it's just like, God didn't intervene. God didn't show up. And, And it just doesn't seem right. God does not seem fair. Maybe you love life. 
And for whatever reason, either you got a diagnosis or, or somebody in your family got a diagnosis and it changed the course of your family, right? They're, they're, they're ill, they, they had cancer, they had to go through chemo. And, and just, it just doesn't seem fair. It doesn't seem right. Like, why us? Why me? Why our family? If you've ever felt that way, if you've ever felt like God doesn't seem fair, Habakkuk, a spokesman on behalf of God, comes at God and says, hey, I'm praying and it doesn't seem like you're listening. I'm asking you to stop the violence in our culture and you don't save. So that, that's his first problem. The second problem that Habakkuk has with God is he doesn't seem, it feels like God doesn't really care. He, he has this disposition, hey, God, you don't really care. Look at verse three and four. He says, why do you make me look at injustice? Why do you tolerate wrongdoing, destruction, and violence are before me? There's strife and conflict abounds. Therefore, the law is paralyzed and justice never prevails. The wicked him in the righteous so that justice is perverted. What, what, what's he saying? He's saying the good guy doesn't always win. Follow, I thought following you brought benefits. Right? I, I thought if, if, I, if I was following you, God, that, that everything was going to work together for good. Right? I, I thought that life was going to be easier. And here Habakkuk is saying, hey, I'm following you. I'm praying to you. I'm crying out to you. And you know what you do? You put me face to face with all the injustice in the world. You allow me to see that the good guy does not always win. In fact, the bad guy wins a lot of the time. If you ever watch The Bachelor, you know this, right? Like the bad guy does win, right? And, and we've been conditioned by Disney. We've been conditioned by the American dream. We've been conditioned by Marvel comic movies that, hey, just do the right thing and justice will prevail. That's not always the case, is it? I mean, look at the crime rate in the city of Indianapolis over the last three years. It just continues to escalate every single night. There was like, there was like 14 or 16 shootings a couple weeks ago in one night in the city of Indianapolis. And you turn on the TV and it's just like, here's the murders in 2017 and here's the murders in 2018. And they just keep going up. And all of this, all, a lot of great people are putting their heads together and developing plans to try to stem the violence in our city. And you know what happens? It just keeps getting worse. And you're like, God, why, why can't you intervene? All of these people are doing good. They're trying to resurrect these neighborhoods, trying to love on people, trying to love them into getting along with one another. Look at the school shootings, the mass shootings. And it's, it's so hard not to be discouraged and think, man, when does the good guy win? And there's this sense from Habakkuk that he says, hey, God, do you even care? Are you even there? And maybe you know what this feels like. Maybe it's not to the degree of violence. But maybe there's this person that you work with and, and they're not even nice. They take advantage of people and they walk on people and everybody in the office knows it. And yet they're the most successful. Maybe you follow someone on social media and everybody loves their stuff, but you know who they really are. And you're like, if you just spent five minutes with this person, you would not love them, right? But they're so popular and they're so beloved. And you think to yourself, when, am I, when is my faithfulness going to be recognized? God, when are you going to show up? When are you going to do good for me? Because it doesn't seem like you're doing, you're doing good for everybody else and not me. And Habakkuk takes huge issue with God. He says, God, do you even care? I, I, I'm, I'm challenging your goodness and being fair. And now he's challenging his providence. Now he's cha challenging his compassion, saying, God, do you even care about what's going on? Because all I see is injustice. That's all you're showing me. The last, the last problem I think that Habakkuk has with God, he outlines in, verse, or in uh, chapter 1, he says God isn't doing as much as he could. See, God hears Habakkuk's complaints. God listens. Here's what I love. God absorbs his accusations. He doesn't lose his temper over his questions. God enters into this dialogue with Habakkuk out of compassion, out of love, out of grace. And he begins to respond to what Habakkuk has just accused him of, of not being fair and not really caring. And, and basically being absent. Like, what are you doing? Are you not listening? You're not acting? You're not doing anything about the injustice? The world just keeps getting worse? And here's what God says back to Habakkuk in, uh, in uh, Habakkuk chapter 1. 
says this. He says, look at the nations and watch and be utterly amazed. This is going in a good direction. For I am going to do something in your days that you would not believe, even if you were told. Stay, stay right there for a second. Go back to that, yeah. So I imagine as Habakkuk is having this conversation with God, he's like, sweet. God parted the Red Sea. God rained down manna from heaven. God you know, had the sun stand still. God um, you know, brought ro- uh, water out of a rock. Like God is amazing. He's getting ready to show out. He's getting ready to show off. He's getting ready to show up in a brand new way. He's going to do something incredible. My prayers are being effective. I'm sure there was a lot of optimism going into this first response from God. And then look what God says. I'm raising up the Babylonians, that ruthless and impetuous people who sweep across the whole earth to seize dwellings, not their own. They are feared and dreaded people. They are our law unto themselves and they promote their own honor. What? What? God's saying, hey, I'm getting, get, get ready. I'm getting ready to blow your mind. I'm getting ready to do something amazing. I'm getting ready to do something big. What am I going to do? I'm going to unleash your greatest enemy on you. I'm going to allow them to conquer you. I'm going to allow them to overtake you. I'm going to allow them to wage war against you. They don't even take names. They just go and they just kick butt. All right, that's what they do. So get ready because I'm getting ready to do something incredible. The problem is, it's not what Habakkuk thought it was going to be. And here's what, I, what I've realized about my own life spiritually, maybe, maybe you've been there. That the, mo- the most complicated place to be in your faith is to know that God could have intervened and realized that he didn't. One, one of the... One of the rawest and, and one of the most authentic places that you can be in your relationship with God is to think about God's sovereignty and to think about God's power and his omniscience and to realize he could have done something and he did not do something. H- how do you reconcile that? What, what do you do with that? Um, one of the things that um, I've realized in my own life personally I'll move this out of the way so everybody can see, um, is that we, we have a vision for our life that isn't necessarily rooted in God's vision for our life. It's rooted in how we think our life should go, which isn't always sinful or bad, but most of the time we envision it going up and to the right. right? We envision taking ground in each year of our life. We're gonna, our marriage is going to get better. Or if we're married, our relationship with our kids is going to get better. Our income is going to go up. Our standard of living, our quality of life is going to get better over time. We, we have this vision that if we're in a relationship with God, the longer that we're in a relationship with God, the better our life is going to be, which there's, there's a lot of benefits. I'm not, I'm, we're going to get to the back half of the message here in just a second. So I'm, I don't know, this is like, wow, so encouraging on Memorial Day. Thank you, Justin. So glad I got up early on Memorial Day to come to hear this message. But um, so if, you, if, this, if this is kind of a, a graph of your life, like, and, and these, are, these are years, you, you, we feel like our, our life is going to go up and to the right. And the longer that we live, the better life is going to be. But if you look throughout Scripture, and if you look at your own life personally, I guarantee you you're going to see this pattern that it's easy to experience God. It's easy to worship God. It's easy to praise God. It's easy to give God credit when things are going well. But predominantly, the way that our relationship grows most with God is when we hit a valley. Right? Because... Along with blessing, along with praise, along with worship, what often comes on the mountain tops is self-reliance. It's pride. It's arrogance. It's look how talented I am. Look how gifted I am. Look how much I can earn. Look how many promotions I can get. Look how much I can accomplish. Look how many deals I can close. Look how great I can create my standard of living and my family life. And, and we don't do this oftentimes Consciously, it's just this subtle seep into our self-conscious and into our spiritual life. I read a book um, few, uh, several years ago. It's called The Dip, and it's by a guy named Seth Godin. And I don't know if I've mentioned it uh, here on Sunday mornings before. I couldn't remember, so I just thought I'll, I'll just share it with you again. And it's not a Christian book. It's a secular book on marketing. But it's a, just a real tiny book. The subtitle of the book is When to Stick and When to Quit. And the premise of the book is that every entrepreneur that starts a business, for the most part, a lot of them experience success initially. 
Things go up and to the right. They, they have a new product. They have you know, uh, uh, something that people need. They have uh, an idea that, that is accepted by the market and things begin to go well. But inevitably, for every single business owner, for every single entrepreneur, anytime that someone starts something new, they hit a wall. And what you do when you hit that wall determines the direction and the quality of your company going forward. And one of the things that Seth Godin says, actually the premise of the entire book is this, is this premise, that most entrepreneurs give up right before a breakthrough. And I, I, I'm so grateful that I read that book a few years ago because it shaped how I see my marriage, it shaped, it shaped how I see my relationship with my kids, it shaped how I see my relationship with God, and it shaped how I lead here at Hope City. We, we launched the church, we had initial success, right? We sent out a 45,000 piece mailer, we had 400 people at our very first service, we, we took a little dip and we started building up, and, and every time you hit a growth rate, every time you hit a milestone, every time you, you attain something new, you hit a wall, Right? And, and I have to make a decision as a pastor. Am I going to push through the wall? Am I going to push through the dip? Am I going to push through this downturn to experience God's, you know, the betterment of God's presence on the other side? And you have to make a decision as well. That somehow when you hit the valley, what happens is when you don't give up on God, but you invite God into the valley, when you don't blame God for the valley, but you actually give him credit for the valley, when you don't resent the valley, but you actually look forward to God's presence in the valley, that's when God meets you with his presence and his power that you can't discern, you can't control, and you can't manipulate. And what happens is, You come out stronger on the other side of the valley, not because of anything that you did, but because of everything that God did. And God gets the credit for not just rescuing you from the valley, but meeting you in the valley and giving you hope in the valley and allowing your faith to grow in the valley. And I would say this, that predominantly our faith cannot grow without valleys, that valleys are a necessity for us to experience an authentic faith with Christ. That it's in the valleys that we are stripped of ourselves, that we are stripped of the predisposition that we have of God and we have of our own life. And God begins to show up and he begins to peel back layers of your life and layers of your heart and layers of brokenness and dysfunction that you and I would not address otherwise. He says, hey, watch what I'm going to do. And somewhere in chapter 2 of Habakkuk, Habakkuk goes through this process of meeting God in the valley, and he comes out of the valley. And I want to give you, as we close, I just want to give you uh, three principles, three things to do when you're in the valley, three ways that we can find hope. The first is this. Oh, wait, I want to share this quote with you before, because it's so good. Do you have that quote, most powerful? Yeah. Craig Rochelle says this. I think it's so powerful. He's talking about being in the valley. He says the most powerful praise is the praise right before the provision. When you're your most desperate and you choose to praise God anyway, I, I just love that quote. Just get, I mean, I'm just getting chills just thinking of it. And I would say that's really good because it's not mine, it's his, right? I, can, he, he is, I didn't say that, he said it. It's just good stuff. It's just a, a reminder that the most powerful praise you can give God is the praise right before he shows up for you. Why? Because it, it's a demonstration of your utter dependence on him. So let's look at th- uh, three, uh, w- three things to do when you're in the valley. First is this, remember the faithfulness of God. So he comes out, um, Habakkuk comes out of this valley and he, he starts looking at, a, at God and at his circumstances in a different way. And look what he says in chapter 3. He says, his splendor was like the sun, sunrise, rays flashed from his hand. Where his power was hidden, plague went before him, pestilence follows his steps. He stood and shook the earth. He looked and made the nations tremble. He's talking about the goodness and the greatness and the power and the prestige of God. The ancient mountains crumbled and the age-old hills collapsed, but he marches on forever. He's talking about how everything in heaven and earth is going to pass away. Everything in heaven and earth is disposable, but the faithfulness of God. God is the one standard. God is the one uh, constant. God is all powerful and he's all faithful. Y- yesterday, um, we were moving uh, Mike and, and his wife Riley into their apartment, and Marty and Michelle, Riley's mom and dad, were down from Michigan, and um, we were just talking through the, the circumstances that brought 
uh, Micah to Noblesville. And that's where, that's where we're living, but he's at the Carmel campus of Northview. And it was, just, it was just incredible. And so we were talking about, you know, he did an internship there two summers ago. And um, their, uh, their youth pastor texted me, I have a good relationship with him. And he said, hey, what are you doing with Mike after he graduates? Are you going to hire him at Hope City? I'm like, three Davises on the same staff, not good, all right? So no, we're not going to hire him. I said, in fact, I think he needs to go to another church to get more experience. And, and how he's wired, we would drive each other crazy. And, and, uh, and I said, I, I think he needs to, to you know, just be somewhere else for a while. And he said, well, since you're not hiring, I'm going to hire him. And I never thought of it. I thought, well, that's, you know, thanks for the compliment. I, I know my son did a good job at his internship. And so back in, uh, back in January, Kent texted him and said, hey, uh, I got promoted and uh, my, my position is going to be open. I want you to apply for it. And uh, many of you guys know this, but uh, Micah played basketball for three years at Indiana Wesleyan, did three years at Indiana Wesleyan. Then he transferred to a smaller school in Illinois and uh, wanted to have a greater role in the team, and they were not as good, but wanted to have a greater role in the team, and so he lost, I don't know, 26 credits in the transfer. I don't know what, why it would be accredited if you're not going to gain all your credits, but anyway, uh, that's an argument I have with the registrar, but um, I was like, dollar signs just gone, you know, and, um, and, and so he, he wasn't going to graduate until next May. He had a year worth of eligibility. He was redshirted in his freshman year, and so he was just chilling in Illinois, and so when Kent texted him, he said, hey, I don't have my degree. And uh, he's like, we'll cross that bridge when we come to it. And he's like, I don't have any experience. We'll cross that bridge when we come to it. And so he goes through the interview process, comes down to two final candidates. And sure enough, they, they offer Micah the job. And, and just looking at the circumstances, this thing after thing after thing. And we we're, were talking about this in, as we were moving them in and unpacking them yesterday. And Riley's mom said, I've told the kids they need to start a faithfulness journal. Because you can't look at this circumstance. You can't look at all of the ways that God showed up and God provided and God came through and not think, man, God has unbelievable plans for me. God's been faithful. And then she said, it's so easy to forget. And so I told him to start writing it down. As part of the reason why I journal, I have probably six or seven of these laying around the house and uh, some of them have sermon notes in it. Some of them have notes that I've written down from podcasts. But a lot of it is just the, writing down the faithfulness of God. Answered prayers, unanswered prayers, fears, anxieties, things that, things that keep me up at night, things that I've seen God come through with. And there's no scientific or even spiritual you know, um, magic to journaling, but it is easy to forget God's faithfulness. You know why I know that? Because if you look all throughout the Old Testament, it's why the nation of Israel, they built altars, they stacked rocks, they named uh, wells after God would bring well uh, or water up into a well, they would name it to, to remember God's faithfulness. They created festivals. They created traditions. They told stories. Why? Because they knew it was going to be easy to forget. Take the, the giving of the Ten Commandments. Moses goes up on the mountain to receive the Ten Commandments right after God had part of the Red Sea. And he comes down and what are they doing? They're worshiping idols. They're melting down gold. You think, well, they're really stupid. How could they not look at God's faithfulness? I think we do the same thing. Right? God brings us through something amazing, and we're like, oh, I, I, you know, we, God, we're, you know, God doesn't really get the credit. I'm really talented. Right? And we look to ourselves. And so it's easy to, if you're, folk, if you're in the valley, to forget the faithfulness of God. And so all throughout the verse, next seven verses, verse 7 through, through verse 15, Habakkuk just starts recounting in song form. This is really a song that he writes. If you look at the, the text in a, in a Bible, it's, it's written almost like a poem or a song. But he talks about the bread of heaven and food from ravens and water from a rock and fire from heaven. He caused the sun to stand still. He shut the mouths of lions. He breathed life into dry bones. It's just this, this recounting from Habakkuk about the faithfulness of God. And if you want to experience hope in the valley, if you're in a valley today... Remember God's faithfulness. Don't just focus on the things that you think God isn't showing up for. Remember the ways that God has shown up and it'll allow you to experience hope in the valley. It's why we have Memorial Day, right? To remember the faithfulness and the sacrifice of the people. It's why the theme of 9-11 is what? Never forget, right? We have created things in our culture to help us remember things in the past. And the same thing is true about God. That maybe you need a faithfulness journal. Maybe you need to, uh, to remember the ways that God has shown up if you're in a dark place this morning to have confidence that he will show up again. But secondly, we need to declare the goodness of God. 
Look at Habakkuk 3, 7 through 15. It says, I heard and my heart pounded and my lips quivered at the sound. Decay crept into my bones and my legs trembled. Yet I will wait patiently for the day of calamity to come on the nation invading us. Talking about the Babylonians. Now, check this out. Though the fig tree does not bud and there are no grapes on the vines, though the olive crop fails and the fields produce no food, though there are no sheep in the pen and no cattle in the stalls, verse 18, yet I will rejoice, I will be joyful in the God my Savior. Now, you, excuse me, you read that passage and you think, how is God good in that? The crops are failing, the sheep are gone, there's no cattle. There's, there, there's, no, there, there's nothing on the trees. They're being overtaken by their enemies. That's where we get in trouble. We start focusing on the circumstances. Habakkuk turns his focus onto the faithfulness of God. He turns his focus onto God's goodness. He says, I'm not going to focus on my circumstances. Despite my circumstances, I'm drawing a line in the sand. I'm placing a stake in the ground. I am going to be joyful. I am going to praise God. And you read that and you think, well... He's just in denial. That's just Christian denial, right? It's like, just give up and go to God, right? Just say, you know, just say, pray a little bit more. God's faithful. God works all things for good. We get all these Christian sayings that we get when times of trial happen, when times of distress or heartache happen. We toss around all of these cliches. And what happens is, not that those are bad, but those can be seen as just spiritual denial. It's almost like we're, we're just encouraged to ignore our circumstances because if we actually acknowledge our circumstances and somehow our faith is weak. This isn't an, uh, uh, ignoring the circumstances. This isn't this Christian denial. This is saying, hey, in spite of my circumstances, I'm going to rejoice. And I, I put these three phrases uh, in, in your notes. And I, if you're a note taker, I, I want you to write them down or maybe take a picture of the screen because you might need them in the weeks or months ahead. But when you're in a place of, of the valley and you want to focus and declare God's goodness... My God is still on the throne. It's the first thing to remember. What's that basically saying? There is a God and it's not you. Okay? That, that's just the acknowledgement. There is a God, it's not me. The second statement is this. My God has always been good. And that's, that's a true statement. Your circumstances may have not always been good, but God has always been good in the midst of your circumstances. And finally, my God is always faithful. But God is always faithful. It's just this, this reminder of, of the truth that we tell ourselves. A lie believed as though it were truth carries the power of truth in your life. And, and so if you want to find hope in the valley, you've got to remind yourself of truth. My God is always on the throne. He's still on the throne. He's always been good, and he's always been faithful. We, we don't live in denial. We live with resolve. That's what, that's what Habakkuk is. He's not in denial of his circumstances. He's just in resolve that despite his circumstances, he's still going to find hope. He's still going to meet God, and God's still going to meet him. Finally, worship the sovereignty of God. Sovereignty is not a word we really talk about a lot. Um, it's kind of a big Christian word, but look at verse 19. It says, The sovereign Lord is my strength. He makes me as sure-footed as a deer and keeps me safe on the mountaintops. The word sovereignty it means power. It means perfect authority. That when you recognize the sovereignty of God, what you recognize is that God is in control and that's okay. That you're not in control and that's okay. That God has a plan for your life. And even if it's not going as you think it should right now, that he is still in control and that he still loves you and that he still has good in store for you despite the negative circumstances or the value that you might be in. And what you, what you and I do when we worship is, worship is really just turning our attention toward God. You can worship at work, you can worship um, on the soccer field, you can worship in, in your neighborhood, you, you can worship by singing. Singing is just a form of worship. But worship itself is turning our attention and our adoration and our posture toward a God who is sovereign. It's recognizing that I am not in control and although I feel insecure and although I feel anxious about not being in control, I will recognize that God is in control. And we worship not just to sing songs, but to declare God's goodness and to acknowledge God's faithfulness and to worship him for his sovereignty. And here's the truth. We enjoy God on the mountaintops. We learn to trust him in the valleys. And so if you're in a valley right now, that's not God's punishment. It could be God's preparation. It's not, it's not God leaving you. 
it might just be God preparing you. It's not God saying, hey, you've messed up, and so I'm putting you into this, you know, this, here's your sentence. God's saying, no, I'm going to meet you in the valley, and you're going to get to know me more in the valley, and you're going to trust me more in the valley, and you're going to recognize me more in the valley. And the mountaintops are good, but it's the, the valleys that build our faith. It's the valleys that allow us to trust God in deeper ways. Let's, uh, let's pray together. As we close this morning, I just want to give some of you a chance just to be seen, be heard, be acknowledged. If there's a valley that you're facing in your life right now, maybe it's in a relationship, maybe it's in your job, maybe it's in your relationship with God, maybe it's in your marriage, and you just feel like you're either on a slope downward or you're at the bottom. And you've maybe been nervous to acknowledge it because you felt like maybe your faith isn't great enough. I I just want to pray for you today. And so if you feel like you're in a valley this morning and in some area of your life, would you just raise your hand right where you're at? Say, God, I'm in a valley. I'm in a dark place. I'm in a wounded place. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you for your vulnerability. I want to pray for you right now. 